Kia ora koutou. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming out on a pretty drizzly lunchtime. So uh, I much appreciate having an audience. Um, probably you won't have met me before. You may have seen some of the wanted posters up around Parliament. I'm Peter Thompson. I'm a lecturer in the Media Studies Programme. I'm primarily a political economist. I do a lot of media policy analysis. I'm chair of the Better Public Media Trust, and I'm also the editor of the Political Economy of Communication Journal. Um, there, is, uh, there is actually a few copies of my paper uh, related to this talk over there if you want a copy. Otherwise, if you do want one, please feel free to email me. Um, Carla advises us that uh, you're all very busy and some of you may need to rush off at lunchtime. Um, by the time I finish, you might already feel like rushing off. Um, but but if, if you need to leave after the talks, then uh, by all means, just, uh, just make your way out. So I'm going to start off by... Uh, introducing some themes about the Christchurch call, um, and then my good colleague Marchin is going to uh, kind of follow on. What I want to be able to try and do in about 15 minutes is uh, look at how far the Christchurch call uh, provides a workable policy framework for dealing with online terrorism and extremist content. Um, I want to consider the scope of the Christchurch call as a response to some of the broader regulatory issues raised by social media and digital intermediaries. Um, I also want to have a look at some of the motives behind Mark Zuckerberg's uh, rather generous gesture of welcoming regulatory intervention and the digital intermediary's willingness to engage with state regulators. And I want to argue that the Christchurch call, I think it is a positive first step, but I also think it's the tip of the iceberg. And if we want to deal with some of the broader issues that we face regarding social media and digital intermediaries, then we need a wider regulatory framework. So, well, I, I don't think I need to reiterate what happened on, uh, on March, you know, March 15th this year. I mean, obviously, the events were terrible, you know, the national tragedy. Um, the uh, live streaming of the, of the terrorist activities that killed 51 people <coughs> at the two Christchurch mosques was obviously unprecedented in New Zealand. But, of course, what brought it, things into focus is the fact that it was live streamed. And, in fact, the entire 17-minute live stream was watched by 200 people before you know, th th this became known to anyone else. None of them reported it. And it was only after 29 minutes that the video was reported to Facebook, by which time 4,000 people had seen it. Um, that day, or at least within the next 24 hours, Facebook removed 1.5 million uploads of the video. Uh, 1.2 million incidentally were blocked automatically, but that meant 300,000 got through its algorithms and its filters. Um, and then it was widely uploaded to a range of other media, including uh, dodgy websites like 8chan and Kiwi Farms, which isn't Kiwi, incidentally. Um, and even a month later, there were, there were you know, examples of, of the video and the terrorist manifesto circulating on a whole variety of websites. I mean, one YouTube video had over 720,000 views. So quite understandably, there's a question about, well, what are we going to do about this? We can't have terrorist live streaming mass murder. Two months later, we have the Paris summit, the Christchurch call, uh, initiated and chaired by Jacinda Ardern and Emmanuel Macron. Um, and the stated aim was to eliminate terrorist and violent extremist content online. Well, a noble cause, I'm sure you'd agree. They brought together 17 governments, uh, including uh, also the European Commission, and the eight major tech firms, including Facebook, Google, YouTube, and Twitter. Um, it was premised on the recognition that you needed a multilateral, supranational forum to deal with some of these issues rather than just a domestic response from individual governments. And given that they only had 24 hours, I mean, they did come up with a non-binding pledge document uh, outlining a range of responsibilities and obligations on governments and, and uh, online service providers. Now, I think it was aspirational. Uh, I think the pledge de deals more with what's and, and perhaps than perhaps how's and when's. But arguably, I think the Christchurch call did have a degree of success in setting the platform for continued multilateral negotiations. Now, I'm not going to go through all of this. You can go to the website and have a look. But governments obviously have to you know, take responsibility for countering the drivers of terrorism enforce applicable laws, support frameworks and industry standards to reduce extremist content, and so on. 
Online service providers have to take more responsibility for addressing extremist content in a speedy fashion, I mean, create more transparency in community standards, you know, implement me you know, mechanisms to reduce the spread of this type of material, you know, implement more transparent public reporting, etc. And there's a whole bundle of things that they're all responsible for, including some uh, obligations to engage with civil society, and I haven't got time to go through all that, but quite a lot of material. But I don't think the Christchurch call should be seen as primarily or only a response to the mosque attacks in New Zealand. It came, in, it came about in a very particular context, and that context was one of a wider trajectory towards you know, both domestic and regional state interventions in controlling social media and digital intermediaries. And I think that stems from a growing acknowledgement that there, there are a range of economic, political and civic harms that have stemmed from the ways in which these, these tech companies are operating. And that includes questions over privacy relating to the mass harvesting of personal data and its use by third parties, their power over, uh, over audience content discovery, Okay. and the facilitation of filter bubbles, echo chambers, and the proliferation of fake news. Um, th there's also questions about the way in which that certain parties have used social media data to interfere with electoral processes. I'm thinking particularly of Cambridge Analytica. I haven't got time to talk about that today, but if you Google it, you won't sleep at night. Um, and, and also the impact of digital intermediaries on traditional media business models and systemic avoidance of taxes. I mean, they've sucked advertising revenues out of, uh, out of the traditional media whose content they use to actually generate the traffic for their own revenues. But that's another story, for t not for today. So Mark Zuckerberg, I mean, apparently does care. He uh, said in a piece in the Washington Post that he sees uh, a more active role for governments and regulators and says regulation... Uh, could set baselines for what's prohibited and require companies to build systems for keeping harmful content to a bare minimum. Okay, well, I'm sure that's meant, meant sincerely. And in some ways, it's a significant normative shift if you go and look at the way that Facebook and some of the other tech companies have behaved in the past. Um, there's certainly been some recent investigations that suggest they've got a significant conflict of interest between their commercial revenues and their community standards. In the UK, the Channel 4 um, Dispatches program uncovered a policy called Shielded Review, which saw you know, quite extreme right-wing hate speech referred up the ladder, up the chain of command, if it was on a website that was generating significant online traffic and therefore generating ad revenue. Um, and quite often they tolerated the presence of groups like Britain First, uh, simply because they were actually creating traffic that made, made advertisers interested. Um, meanwhile, Vice's motherboard has run a series of investigations into the way that, that social media uh, tried to control um, white supremacist content. And in some cases, I mean, Facebook adopted a policy of banning white supremacist references, but they allowed references to white nationalism and white separatism. Now, since Christchurch, they've cracked down on that, but it took that event to actually make them take the issue seriously. They also uncovered evidence that Twitter wasn't blocking a lot of right-wing material because they were scared it might actually affect Republican politicians who had been elected. So there's a conflict here. Now, there's been a, a fairly strong response in some cases. They've just been hit with a $5 billion fine by the US Federal Trade Commission over their role in Cambridge Analytica. Um, Germany has introduced the Network Enforcement Act, I know Marchan is going to talk about that, so I won't go into that in more detail. Both France and the UK have announced plans to introduce levies on the turnover of these digital intermediaries. Um, Donald Trump's not very happy about it, but <laughs> it, it, it's apparently going to happen in France at least. And in the UK, the online harms white paper um, proposes a, a whole series of, of measures under a duty of care um, and this would include a new regulatory body with the power to impose fines, but, but the focus would be on reducing harmful content, but also includes source transparency, you know, who's actually producing news and proliferating it to, in an attempt to try and reduce fake news proliferation and filter bubbles. Again, in France, the new report that's just come out 
uh, calls for an independent regulator, and it also calls for algorithmic transparency, it requires these social media to open up their algorithms to inspection, you know, make them accountable to the civic interest. It would also impose greater responsibility for content moderation and protection of user integrity. And this, again, this, this idea of a duty of care, or a popular term, an information fiduciary, actually making these, these intermediaries responsible for our data and accountable to us, you know, to actually make sure that they use the data in ways that don't actually damage our own personal interests. Um, the French Parliament's also got a takedown law, um, got to get rid of obviously hateful content within 24 hours, and as you probably know, Australia jumped in feet first. Uh, after Christchurch, within two weeks, uh, Parliament had approved a, a bill to, uh, to penalise the publication of, of what they called abhorrent violent material, um, then there's actually, actually jail sentences attached to that, although they are dealing, that deals with very extreme stuff. There's also the ACCC Digital Platforms Inquiry that talks about rebalancing the relationship between the, the, the news sector and the digital intermediaries to actually create a fairer relationship, along with greater measures for privacy protection and reduction of fake news. So there's a lot of things going on. Okay? And a lot of this was in the pipeline beyond, you know, before the Christchurch tragedy. So Facebook come along, and I don't think they're coming to the Christchurch call because they feel any grand civic ob 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 you know, obligation or for that matter, remorse necessarily for things that have happened. I think primarily they're getting involved with regulators and engaging out of strategic self-interest. Well, for one thing, where they're operating without legal definitions of, of, about harmful content or moderation, it's actually for them rather difficult to assess regulatory risk. I mean, and actually if there's laws saying this material's illegal, block it, this material's okay, that's fine, they, they've got a, a natural legal defense. I mean, they, it's almost a catch-all, saying we're complying with all relevant laws. So that, that, that's actually helpful to the companies to have a clear legal definition. And it puts the onus on the regulator to deal with the complexities about where to draw the line on what's terrorist, you know, or what's extremist. Meanwhile, consistent multilateral regulatory frameworks are a lot less complex to deal with than a, an accumulation of very disparate regulatory regimes implemented across different jurisdictions. So, you know, if, if you've got laws coming in in France and Britain, Australia and Canada and all these other, other countries, and you, the, they don't all match up, that becomes very complicated for the intermediaries. So actually having a, a one-size-fits-all multilateral agreement would actually be, be, be convenient for them. Engagement with state regulators, meanwhile, gives the intermediaries a say over the shape and the scope of interventions and the possibility of pushing interventions liable to affect their bottom line off the bargaining table. And I think one of the key agendas that, that, that we're seeing emerge from Christchurch is an attempt to try and quarantine the regulatory response to matters of content moderation, particularly content moderation where the digital intermediaries remain the agents of intervention. And that does little to, to redress the structural network power of these incumbent intermediaries over you know, their control over content discovery and the harvesting and abuses of personal data. So I've got a value chain model here, fairly standard media value chain, running from sort of uh, the production of content, you know, the, the uh, accumulation and aggregation of content, licensing, distribution, content discovery, and audiences. And I think this is useful to actually think, what's the point of intervention? Where do we actually want <coughs> regulators to focus their actions? Because at the moment, the Christchurch call is primarily focused to here on, on the issue of content. And that's important, but I think that's the tip of the iceberg if the wider goal is to address some of the structural issues surrounding these digital intermediaries. Now, the existing regulatory frameworks actually do a reasonable job in many cases of dealing with that content. In New Zealand, the chief censor moved very quickly to, to list that con you know, the, the terrorist video and the manifesto, apparently still available online on Radio New Zealand today. Not on Radio New Zealand, they reported it. Um, but but, <laughs> but, but they, you know, the, the, there, there was a very quick move to classify that material as objectionable. So the laws are already there to control content. 
But here's the issue. Neither broadcast or film, literature or telecommunications regulation deal with the spaces in which these digital intermediaries operate. You know, they operate as platforms that provide the algorithms and architectures of content discovery. That's down here. It's a weird space, and our regulatory models don't really address this. And that's where I think we need to pay close attention. So, well, looking at the value chain, where might we go? Well, okay, you can look at content, moderating extremist content. That's where the Christchurch call is looking. Okay. Well, you could deal with media literacy. You can inform the public and educate them, maybe even give them more rights over the personal data so that they know how to engage with these, these intermediaries. You could enhance uh, internet service provider obligations so to block in extremist websites. Interestingly, Spark unilaterally moved to block 8chan quite recently. You know, it didn't even need a, a government to tell it to do that. You could impose transparency requirements on information and news sources so we find out who's proliferating fake news. You could impose consumer protection requirements or information fiduciary codes on personal data you know, to restrict how, how this information gets used. And you could impose requirements to make the algorithms that enable con this content discovery transparent and actually make them accountable to the civic interest. Or if you're Elizabeth Warren, you could even uh, break up the platform monopolies, although I fear that that would be cutting the head off the Hydra only to find out that it grew two more in its place. So to conclude, look, I think the Christchurch Call Summit provides a useful platform to progress deliberations on the international multilateral regulation of these digital intermediaries and social media in the long term. But even if you've got 17 governments and eight corporations who agree to binding requirements, they're certainly not going to, you know, not going to address all the material on the web. America's yet to come to the party. They're quite skeptical about this. You can still find that material on the dark web, I'm sure, if you go to look for it. Having said that, you might stop accidental or inadvertent discovery by regular members of the public who weren't deliberately looking for that content. And that would be a good thing. But you've got to be aware of the vested interests in play. These big intermediaries make a lot of money out of the current business model. Um, and, and what they're trying to do, I think, is try and restrict the, the scope of regulatory intervention to spaces that are safe for their business model. And so in the interim, I actually think that, that we, we should pursue domestic measures as well as the international ones. Because the collection of all those governments moving towards regulation has created the impetus to drive these intermediaries to the bargaining table. And I think we need to keep them there. And we also need to widen the scope of regulatory options and address the structural power of these big companies. Because um, at, at the moment, they have too much power over our data and they have too much power over our content discovery. And when Mark Zuckerberg comes along and says, yes, yes, please, regulators, I think we should be very aware of geeks bearing gifts. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, my name is Marcin Betke. I'm a lecturer at the Law Faculty, which is on the opposite side of the, of the Bunny Street. And my main area of, of interest is uh, IT and, and law, so everything which intersects, uh, is on the intersection of, of, of law and, and technology. And I would like to say a couple of words about the Christchurch call and its possible extensions or, or alternatives. So I will follow up the, the Peter's uh, thought about what we can actually actually do and what we can do do more or do do better. I believe that the, the Christchurch call is a good initiative. It's actually really commendable that, that someone wants to to actually do something good and and took up that the moment to to change at least a small aspect of of social media for for better. Uh, so I'm not going to, to, to overly criticize uh, Christchurch call, in particular I'm not going to, to, to get into the, the, the provisions and, and ask how much meaningful they are. They are, they are voluntary, voluntary by, by their nature and uh, they have to, to remain on the, on the level of some, of some vagueness, unfortunately. What I would like to do, actually, is, is to, 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 to draw a slightly broader picture of what we can do to, to regulate social media. And that, that depends that depends sorry, of what we actually want to, to do to address how deep we want to go with that. 
Whether we want to eliminate terrorist and violent extremist content online, like the, that was the, the goal of the Christchurch call, or we want to make a online social media a safer place for us, or we actually want to tackle the main issue there, so the, the lack of accountability and enormous power of platforms and the fact that they, they actually start to, or they already started to act to the detriment of, the, of their users and societies as a whole. So, and I will go through those, those steps in my, in my presentation, or to those goals, to highlight what and how uh, those things can be, can be achieved. So, the first thing is, can we really eliminate terrorist and violent extremist content online? And the frank answer is, is no, without regulation. Without regulation, we can only play a, a, a whack-a-mole uh, with uh, both platforms and the users. And the whack a -mole with, with users was played during, after the, the Christchurch event when they were changing the video and re reposting, republishing it, it. I think that was 800 different versions of those video uh, posted. And the platforms were taking them, da them down. So the, 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 the game was about to, to cheat the, the upload filters. And the whack a -mole with, with platforms is, is uh, actually what Peter has started uh, to, or, or he said actually, that, that their incentive is is to, uh, they have a conflict of interest. Earning money on clicking on viral content is their incentive. And the second thing is that we don't really have a full data, full statistics of what happened. How many of those, of those videos were seen by whom and, and when exactly it was taken uh, out of the website. We just don't have data, we don't have means for regulating those platforms because they, they don't want general public or governments to have those means. So. And even if we were successful with making them accountable, we really cannot play the same game with all smaller websites around the globe, with 8chan, 4chan, and so on. So it's a losing game, in a way. What we can do, we can do what Spark did uh, to block uh, domain name or IP addresses of, of, uh, uh, of websites that are delivering that, that content, but it's, it's, it's somewhat similar to, to what we actually do with, with uh, child pornography under the, the, the auspices of, of, of uh, Department of Internal Affairs. But this is first, this is, this is road brush, so we are blocking the whole website with all the content inside, whether it's uh, legitimate or illegitimate or... or I don't, I'm not sure that we, really want, we, don't, we do really want private companies to have a free hand in blocking the information sources. You have a, a citation, quotation from, from the, the CEO of Cloudfare who just uh, uh, blocked the 4chan or 8chan, I don't remember, or any other Nazi, Nazi site, a related site, and he just <coughs> said straightforwardly that I just woke up this morning in a bad mood and decided to kick them out of the internet. So the question is, are really terms and conditions of online, of online contracts the best place to regulate freedom of expression? And do we want those people to actually regulate the freedom of expression? And I would like to, to, to say that, that probably not. This is just too, too much. So if the privatization of law enforcement is not the way forward, so let's check what we can do with, with the regulation. And this is the example of, of, of the German German. Uh, Netzwerk durch Setzungsgesetz, which is the, the, their uh, approach to, to, uh, to actually and only enforce already existing, already existing uh, mainly criminal law provisions, which forbid some, some, uh, some content. The act itself, it was heavily controversial, criticized by many, by many, many uh, also international bodies like European Commission. Uh, it only provides users with mechanisms to submit complaints to the online, to the biggest online service platform, and make sure, or that they are taking that things down in a specific time frame. And uh, of course, the, the sanction failure to comply and fine up to 50 million euros. An obligation to be transparent, report every six months, and thanks to that obligation on transparency, we have those those data to to compare from the last uh, full half half year. And we can see the numbers there. And first thing is, is why Facebook is, is, so, is so low in numbers. This is because the, the, the possibility for, for Google or Twitter to actually to complain for the user was easily accessible. It was the drop, for, for example, for Twitter, it was drop down money from the tweet itself. So it was easy to complain. Facebook, 
used so-called dark patterns. So, so they actually made, them, made the form hard to, to find and made the customer to click a couple of times to get to those, to, the, to make a complaint, which ended up with some 500 times less or more, <coughs> or more complaints from the user. But we see, we see if there is a way, there is a tool, many people just, just uh, complain about the, that. And it seems to be, to be working. Let's take a look what actually was removed from Google Transparency Report. Sorry about the, the small font there. This is the comparison of what was actually removed because of the breach of the Google's, they are called community guidelines, so they are global community guidelines, and what was removed because of that particular local German law. So the local German law uh, is responsible for uh, roughly 20% of removals, who was responsible in that time, and it was mainly in the area of hate speech or political extremism, terrorist or unconstitutional, unconstitutional content, and defamation or, or insults. And to be honest, I don't know what to think about it. On the one, on the one hand, it could mean that, that these 1,200 or 1,300 complaints were detected thanks to the new law, which is good. But on the other hand, I was thinking, well, maybe service providers just prefer to, to be on the safe side and to take down things which, which they maybe not, not really, not really uh, breaching, but they don't want to pay 50 million. It's just safer for them to take stuff down. Maybe yes, maybe no. What are the effects of that regulation there? A bit unclear. All the controversies around that are still there. People are discussing that. What it probably achieves, it pushes extreme or illegal content further away from the view of people. And it's not a little, it's a lot, I think. But based on this data, it's hard to assess what's the effectiveness, what's the level of over-reporting, or what's the chilling effect, or actually what to do more. How to improve it? There are some ideas how to improve it. For common database of deleted content to, to actually to know what was there, or publishing complaints about deletions, or uh, finding some, some state authority, independent bodies to which people can appeal to. So those are the ideas about regulation of the uh, content, in fact. This is where Germany is right now with their, with their law. But there's a deeper problem to that. And deeper problem is, is actually that, uh, that there is too much power on the, on, the, on the side of online service providers and that they actually are free completely from or independent from the, from the scrutiny of, of, of states and uh, act independent from their customers. There is a debate to what extent social media with their echo chambers and filter bubbles really cause polarization, radicalization and fuel terrorism. There are prominent academics who say that it's obvious that it just happens. Yeah? And people like Cass Sunstein, for example, with, with his newest book, uh, claims exactly that. But I saw also the, the, the research showing that, that it's not so meaningful. So that's debatable. I, I won't go to, 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 I'm not ready to claim that, that, that social media fuel terrorists by the very nature of their operation. What I can claim, surely, that they are out of control of their customers and states. And there is imbalance of power arising from the, from the architectural to the owner, because they're owners of the architecture where everything happens. And we don't know what happens there. Yeah? And the market model, market model in which customers, individuals, are not really customers, because they, the money comes from the business side of the market, which incentivizes the platforms to gather as much or as many data as possible, because the better profits of the individuals they will have, the more money they will receive from the business side. And it's not actually about attention. It's not actually about, about uh, influencing or shaping consumer behavior. It's shaping our behavior, it's shaping our behavior as constituents, as public servants, as, as individuals. It directly affects autonomy of people. And that's the problem. And that's the problem. And to be honest, we don't know where we are on the spectrum between, between complete lack of transparency and maybe, maybe it's still okay, everything is fine, or on the mass scale, scale deception or manipulation which was 
alleged supposedly happened with Cambridge Analytica. We don't know where we are there. We know that the tools are in place, the mechanisms are in place, and the business model which is there is operating in a way, is actually fueling, is the influencing individuals, shaping their behavior, changing their behavior, is in the core of the business model. It's not some peripherally, it's not the outcome, it's the it's then, then the very element of actually how it works. It has to work like this. So we have to change it somehow. How to change it somehow? How to change it? It's actually a, a picture from my, from my book, which, uh, well, hopefully will, it will, it will uh, be published this, this month, because there is some, some, some holiday delay in, uh, in Europe. I propose, I propose to change to change or shape, to make a structural change in the business model. I propose to, to introduce the, the third parties acting for individual, to put them back in control of their data. It actually doesn't change a lot in the service providers' business models, I mean their use of data and so on. What it changes is that there will be some third party which acts for the individual not for the service provider, doesn't earn, doesn't benefit from data, but is able to provide the user with tools to manage data, all the data, all the privacy settings in those silos of the service providers. So the idea is, because we don't have the leverage because of money, we don't, cannot vote with our feed because it's free. Everything is free. We, cannot, we pay them with data, but we don't have really we don't know how much we pay them, we pay them and we don't know, uh, really, we cannot stop paying and go to other place. But we could have this leverage of actually changing our privacy settings, taking back data, or changing the settings, set the settings or making them to not use those data if we don't want what they are doing with those data. So that's the more or less of idea of, of uh, which is presented fully in the book. It's, well, it's, it's a longer, longer piece. It, what it requires, it's not, it requires not just, as it's seen on this picture, it's not just the legal regulation. It requires those interfaces, those technical tools, those economic tools, which will shape the new, slightly changed business models and therefore incentives of the, of the, of the service providers like Facebook, like Google, and so on. So this is a, some kind some of idea of actually what we can do to move forward, to move, to do more than that, which could make those, those service providers more accountable to the people. So to, to sum up, because it's, 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 it's the high time to do this, so crisis call is good, regulation is, is significantly better than that, and there are some options which are unexplored even for in the more advanced regulation which is right now in Germany, but actually what we should aim for are structural changes to the business model. And this is the, this is, this is the best. I'm not claiming that my idea is the, the, the best in the world, but this is some thinking actually towards that, the structural changes in the business model because this is what we need to do in a longer time. Thank you very much for your appearance, patience, and, and we will gladly uh, take all your questions.